So good morning, guys. First question I have is that was about the midterm. I'm assuming you guys have not received the midterm marks yet because I'm still waiting um, for them to be approved. By, well, anyways. So to make a long story short, the midterm marks were lower than they have been in years. So even though I've used the same exam bank and the same exam review and everything, I don't think I've done a lot different. The exam marks were lower than usual. And one of the things that I see is that uh, there's people getting, I think there's a couple of people that like, it may have been a, a 98 or so. There's at least a couple of people that are really, really high. Uh, a bunch of people in the 90s, a bunch of people in the 80s, but then there's people in, who failed it as well and got lower. Um, according to the statistics, um, there's a few questions that weren't didn't have great statistics, so I'll be removing those ones. Uh, and a lot of the other questions, it definitely showed that the exam was fair, and there are some questions that showed the exam was hard and fair. Last term, the same sort of exam, I think it gave an 82% average. Before doing any editing, it was a 70% average, and that's the lowest I had for an average in, I don't know how long. So I don't understand why that would be. What I've done is I've removed five of the questions, or four or five of the questions that basically uh, less than 50% of the class got the right. Because even though some of those, the statistics show that it could be a good question, it just looked like it was too hard, even though the high achievers were getting the question right and the low achievers weren't. But so uh, I haven't seen, I've sent it back, did some editing remove some questions, send it back, and I'm waiting to have that sent back to me to find out how that affected the uh, the average, okay? The final exam is going to be, I think it's, there's less, I don't want to say it because uh, I think people will find it's easier to study for the uh, final than the midterm, I suspect, but I don't I don't want to lead you astray and say it's going to be easier than having not study and then not do well. So if something happens, if you fail the exam, I really don't think you knew the stuff well enough for whatever the reason is. You can blame me for downplaying how hard the exam was. You can, uh, you can say that there's too much material on the exam, but the fact that we're getting people in the 90s, lots of people in the 90s, um, there may even be a hundreds after I've edited it. Makes me sort of think that even though there's a lot of content and it's challenging, um, it was a fair exam according to the statistics. Okay. So, and historically, uh, I don't know why this year people did worse than in the past. And I can appreciate, I'm not certainly not judging because I know people have families and they have, may have a job that they're trying to do and, and it's hard to learn everything, but. We'll see what happens when the exam comes in. Next week, uh, I'll be a reminder that next week, whatever week that is, days and nights, so it's the 16th, will be um, a lecture in class. And then the following two after that will be in class as well. Dr. Pippa will do, will do the other two, okay? Um, and then I've recorded, out of curiosity, do you guys see that I posted a, a recording already for the last lecture? And I also posted an exam review that's pretty comprehensive uh, that you guys can watch and go through as well that I think would be useful. Uh, did you guys see that? Has anyone watched it? But you guys can see it even though if you haven't watched it. So, so you guys can watch that in advance if you want to. Um, so you can kind of schedule for studying for the finals however you want to. Okay? So any questions before we get move forward on the GI tracks, uh, the selected groups? One of the things... Uh, One of the things that I've noticed is that people that I've whose names I've never seen before tend to be people who didn't do as well on the exam and people who 
whose names I recognize often uh, than people who did well on the exam. So uh, the other concern that I have is that people are either not watching the recordings or leaving it all at the last minute. And I think this is a course that's hard to cramp study for because of the content. Um, so anyways, so with regards to <clears throat> this section, we're going to talk about selected herbs related to the gastrointestinal tract. And I didn't include every single herb that could be used in this system. Your job as a doctor is to go in and, or as a student, you know, one day at one, you'd be a doctor. What you put into the, to your studying is, is, is going to be what you get out of it. So I'm giving you a little overview of some herbs. If you want to go and get a book out of the library and read into more detail on these selected herbs, I think it's not a bad idea at all. I think it's, that's what I would have done as a student. Um, I think herbal medicine is a topic that you're going to be using in practice. You know, regardless of what you end up, what kind of direction you end up going in, I think herbs will be a part of everyone's practice. I mean, I, if you want to be an acupuncturist, then uh, you know, exclusively, then you would probably have gone to acupuncture school. If you want to be a homeopath exclusively, you should have gone to homeopathy school. Uh, if you want to be a nutritionist, you should have gone to you know school to be a nutritionist. If you that's all you want to do, I think herbal medicine is something that is unique, and I use it all the time. I don't use just herbs, so and I think that's one of the advantages of being a naturopath is that you can use some supplements, you can throw in some acupuncture, you can do some homeopathy with it if you want to. You can uh, do uh, diet, lifestyle, uh, counseling as well. We get to do everything, and herbs is one part of it. So <clears throat> today I'm going to talk about some of the herbs that I would say that are commonly used in herbal medicine by an naturopath. Now, depending on what <clears throat> region of the world you're from, you might end up using different herbs than I'm recommending. Or... Maybe you have a preference for one herb for whatever that reason may be over another one. And when you're talking about carminatives, you've got peppermint, you've got fennel, you've got caraway, you've got anise, you've got, you know, there's so many different herbs that do the same action that there's basically 30 herbs that are almost identical on indication that you could use, but I'm only mentioning a couple of them because those are kind of the main ones that tend to get used in practice. But in a pinch, if you have some bloating and gas and you're in your kitchen and you happen to have some fresh dill and you eat a bunch, it probably is going to help, or parsley or whatever it may be. So just because I don't discuss a particular herb isn't because there isn't value in it, it's just because there's only so many herbs I can teach you in a, in a certain time period. And that's where I think it's good to go and do a little extra reading on your own. Read about, if you really get to know 30 herbs and you read the monographs and get to know them backwards and forwards, you don't, you don't have to do it all right now. And if you read those monographs now and then reread them again in three years when you're in fourth year and you've studied the other herbal sections, you're probably going to have an even deeper understanding of them. <clears throat> and then when you use them in practice, you'll have a better understanding of them. So, you know, you're going to be a lifelong learner, I hope. And, uh, and so these are just a few great herbs to start off with. And in reality, I probably know 400 herbs. I really probably know 400 herbs. I don't know them all well, but I know about 400 herbs. <clears throat> and of those herbs, I probably use like 20 herbs 80% of the time in practice. You know, that 20, 80 rule. I suspect that's the case. And there's lots of herbs that I, I understand how they work, but I don't use them in practice ever. Okay? And I think it's good to understand how things work, um, even if you don't use them all the time because they're still they're a backup plan depending on where you are okay so to start off my favorite herb or probably one of my top favorite herbs if not my favorite herb is gentian yellow gentian gentian lutea okay to give a little background on this herb is it grows in the alps and it has a long history in the liquor industry and it's considered to be a pure bitter. It's extremely bitter. All it takes is a few drops and like one drop in your mouth and you will taste it. And most people, the first time they put it in their mouth, they kind of, they cringe and they go, oh, that's bitter. Most people don't like bitters. 
And the reason why people don't like bitter is because I think from an evolutionary standpoint, a lot of bitter things are toxic. So lots of bitter is bad. Sweet things we like, bitter things are bad. But the reality is, is sugar is not good for you to have too much and bitter things we should be eating more in our diet. Now, the bitter component in yellow gentian is primarily probably attributed to uh, the cecoiridoid compound that's in there, okay? Cecoiridoid, if you remember, is the monoterpene lactone, okay? Extremely bitter. And there, it also contains a lot of flavonoids. They call it yellow gentian because the flower is yellow when it, uh, um, when it when it flowers. Um, now, I've taken photographs of this numerous times, and I've never been able to time it where I've been able to get a, an actual flower. So on the left-hand side of the picture, I took at the uh, Botanical Garden in Montreal, and I was there in early June, and it hadn't come into bloom. I missed it by like days, and it was so frustrating. Um, and I've just gone to Italy, and I caught it too late because it was out of season. So, um, so much to my frustration, I've never been able to get it to flower. And it's really hard to grow, actually, I find, um, <clears throat> for some reason. So it grows in the Alps, high altitudes, used in the liquor industry. Historically, it's been used for thousands of years to uh, promote digestion, uh, specifically used for conditions like atonic digestion, meaning a sluggish digestive tract when uh, you need to get all those digestive juices flowing, okay? That's the primary indication. Now, tonics in general have lots of other benefits in the body. What's interesting about gentian is there's also some research showing that it may actually help uh, protect against esophageal cancer, and often people who have uh, a little bit of reflux and heartburn and conditions like that may end up developing gastro, um, uh, gastroesophageal cancers later on. And so there may be some benefit from that. It could be the flavonoid composition because there definitely are a lot of different flavonoids along with these cecoiridoids that are in there, okay? So as a pure bitter, it doesn't have a lot of carminative properties to it. It doesn't have a lot of the essential oils. It may have some, but not tons. It really is considered to be kind of like if there's one classic pure bitter, I would say gentian probably falls under that category. It's not too astringent. There may be some astringency there, but it's not its primary action, in my opinion. And so when you put it in your mouth, immediately you'll start salivating. That's your silent dog. And then your digestive juices start flowing. Your stomach starts to gurgle. That's the stomachic properties. You may or may not feel it, but your gallbladder starts pumping a little bit more. Your liver starts making more bile. Enzymes are being released from the pancreas. It also has been shown because it has those properties uh, as a cold dog and cold erratic, um, it has a hepatic because it has an affinity for the liver. It can be used to treat gallstones, and I've certainly used this herb uh, in herbal formulas or by itself to treat gallstones. I've also used it a lot for conditions where um, if someone had uh, uh, reflux, so if acid was stomach contents were bubbling up into the esophagus. That would be a classic indication for gentian. Now, from the last lecture, remember that the problem with bitters is they have that caution associated with it. So even though it may not be written on the slide, you should know that digestive bitters you need to use with caution with heartburn because it can help with reflux, but it can make heartburn due to gastritis, inflammation of the stomach, from an infection like H. pylori or uh, if someone's taking a lot of ibuprofen, it can make that type of heartburn worse, okay? So the other reason why it can help with uh, reflux is in addition to uh, helping improve digestion and getting it so that food breaks down faster so that it doesn't sit in the stomach so that it descends, it also increases lower esophageal sphincter tone, so it helps tighten that up so that food is less likely to spill up. And also, as a silent dog, when you're constantly uh, salivating and swallowing that saliva, saliva is it's a little bit of a mucusy sort of uh, substance that basically helps to coat the esophagus and uh, prevent the acid from you know, coming in contact with the 
uh, with the mucous membranes in the esophagus. So you're constantly trying to, by, by salivating more, you're washing it down, trying to keep it from uh, remaining up in the, in the esophagus. So all sorts of good properties for general digestion, okay? Um, also, some trials that I've looked at have shown that it has some hepatic protective effects, presumably due to the flavonoids in there. And I'm assuming that the secoiridoids have some anti-inflammatory effects as well that we don't know about. Um, the final thing is that gentian, a lot of these secoiridoids and some flavonoids as well have antimicrobial properties. And we know that um, um, in Chinese medicine, there's Tibetan gen gentian, which is a different variety of gentian. So it's the same genus, gentian lutea, different species. And in Chinese medicine, they have a few different ones as well. And what's interesting is that in those cultures, there's a real emphasis on the fact that these herbs are used to help clear heat. So clear heat from the liver, but also from the digestive tract. So they are often used as antimicrobials and used for skin conditions and, and uh, inflammation and other types of things as well. And presumably the indications are gonna to overlap to the gentium. So gentium's a great verb. Um, another indication that I use it for is people trying to lose weight. If you give them gentium, it helps to recalibrate their sweet tooth. So if someone has a palate of like a two-year-old where all they want is sugar or child, uh, when you give them a digestive bitter like gentium, it shocks their taste buds. So the whole spectrum of bitter and sweet gets shifted over. And so things that they found to be sweet before, like having three sugars in their coffee, suddenly they're like, yeah, that's too sweet for me now. And they naturally start decreasing the amount of carbohydrates, refined carbohydrates that they eat without you telling them to even. Okay. And I've seen this in practice, and as a result, uh, people generally are losing weight when I get them digestive bitters. I think the other benefit for it is it makes people feel a little bit more satiated. Um, and I read one study that showed that people taking bitters could decrease their caloric intake and help to lead to weight loss uh, in patients. So it's not a primary indication for these herbs, but it's a little kind of a, a side off-label indication is, is for weight loss, okay? Now, finally, gentian has a cousin called greater centauri or centauri. Um, and this herb is in the same family, the Gentian gentianaceae family. So very, very similar. It contains secoiridoids. Um, and I would say that when you read the monographs on the two of them, they're almost identical. And I think they probably are identical, just maybe the wording of it's slightly different. And so in my mind, you could use gentian and greater centauri completely interchangeably. You could choose to use one or the other. It wouldn't make a difference. The reality is, is yellow gentian is easier to find, and it's not even that easy to find, but I find it's easier to find than uh, centauri is. Um, so when I learned about these two herbs, I learned them as two separate unique monographs, but I'm putting them together and saying they're essentially the same. And the thing is, I've never actually used greater centauri in practice because I always use gentian. I don't need to stock both of these herbs. I only need to stock one of them because they do the same thing. So here's an example of a redundant herb that is great. And if you're living in an area where this happened to grow wild and it was abundant and it was inexpensive and accessible, you would use this over yellow gentian. Um, so great herb. I use it daily or at least weekly in, in practice uh, um, for indigestion, reflux, gallstones, gallbladder sludge, and also uh, weight loss, okay? Any questions on that last one? Are you guys with me here? Thank you, Darren. Let you. And bitch. So, <clears throat> golden seal is referred by some herbalists as the king of the mucous membranes. 
And the reason for that is it has an affinity for these mucous membranes. And you use it for conditions like sinusitis, gastritis, uh, colitis. So when there's inflammation in the mucous membranes, this is a great indication for Golden Seal. One of the main things that it's used for is an antimicrobial because it contains isoquinoline alkaloids like berberine, but also hydrastine. And hydrastine is kind of unique. You see it to a greater degree in Golden Seal than you would in, I don't even know if it's in Barberine or Oregon Grape and some of the other ones. But when I think of Golden Seal, I use it primarily, its primary indication is as an antimicrobial. Okay, so that's what you use it for, for when there's infections. Now, those isoquinoline alkaloids, like you remember alkaloids in general taste bitter and a lot of them act as digestive bitters. It can be used as a digestive bitter as well, but I wouldn't choose it to be my primary bitter uh, if I'm just trying to only stimulate digestion because I don't like to give strong antimicrobials to people that don't have infections. So you could use it in drop dosage if that's the only herb you have in your cupboard, and that would be fine in, in small amounts. Um, Golden Seal is a relatively expensive herb, and the reason for that is the rhizome or the, the root of this plant takes a few years to mature. And once you harvest it, you got to wait another few years before the seeds germinate and produce new roots. So it's not as renewable and easy a herb to grow, to cultivate, to, and wild crafting. I don't see it very often in the wild. I don't even know if I've ever seen it in the wild. Um, I've seen lots, lots of gardens, that you know, herb gardens, but I haven't actually seen it uh, growing wild in the woods. And I'm always, well, I used to spend a lot of time walking around the woods looking for herbs. Other herbs that are good digestive bitters, like chicory or dandelion, <clears throat> those you see, you know, I walk two feet outside my clinic or home, I can probably find one of those two plants within about three minutes, you know, and that's just, so those would be uh, maybe not better as bitter, but they're more accessible and that alone can make it easier to, to uh, uh, make it better just because you have access to it. So golden seal, one of the big issues with it, I think it's kind of endangered in the wild because uh, of over harvesting in the past, just like how Canadian ginseng has been over harvested so, um, and because they're slow to mature and they don't spread as quickly as dandelions do, um, there's concerns that they can be over harvested. So I would never wild craft this, meaning I would never go into the wild and gather this. Dandelions, I think, go nuts. You know, I don't think you're ever going to have to worry about dandelions going extinct because they basically are found all around the world and pretty much everybody's yard will have a few dandelions in it unless they spread for herbicides. So these antimicrobial properties are associated with the isoquinoline alkaloids, okay? Uh, presumably, they also have these multi-drug resistant pump inhibitors like the flavonyl lignans. Now, most of the research that are done with 5-MHC was done with um, uh, Barbary and Oregon grape, but it appears that Golden Seal does have these MDR inhibitors. Whether or not it's the exact same compound or not, I'm not 100% certain, but I'm pretty sure it is. Now, because of the bitter properties associated with the isoquinoline alkaloids, isoquinoline alkaloids, you can pretty much say it's going to have a lot of the same properties that gentian would have. So bitter, sile dog, stomach, cold dog, choleric. So you don't have to memorize all that. If it's a bitter, you could just, by deduction, say it's going to have all those other properties. Now, another interesting thing that Golden Seal has that I don't really think of gentians having this an antidiarrheal property. Okay, so it's used historically for infectious diarrhea, for colitis, traveler's diarrhea. Research shows that the ice cleaning alkaloids like berberine and hydrastine have uh, properties against not just bacteria, but also parasites. And so cholera, giardia seem to, uh, seem to be inhibited or killed off with these substances. Now, when you compare it to the uh, antiparasitic drugs used to treat Jardia, I don't know if they're going to work as well or work as quickly, 
but a lot of those drugs are pretty toxic. So I would be um, reluctant to some, some people don't like taking them. I've taken them much before. I didn't really enjoy the, the whole thing. I had already when I was in India. Um, so they could be used as an alternative if people didn't want to take those other drugs, but I can't really guarantee they're going to work as well. Uh, but they certainly won't have the side effects. With golden seal, it's also been used historically for sinusitis, for respiratory tract infections, for tonsillitis. Um, also, if someone had H. pylori, I would use golden seal with other herbs to treat that. Now, here is the catch, as I mentioned before. If you have H. pylori infections causing a stomach ulcer and you give them a digested bitter, it'll increase stomach acid and could make it worse. And that is true. So you'd have to be careful about the dose. I've given it to people and I kind of aggravated it a little bit in the beginning, but I also combined it with other things like licorice and demulcent herbs so, and uh, vulnerary. So it seemed to be short, la uh, relatively short lasting. So just to be aware of that, if you're going to be using it to treat off an infection like H. pylori, it could make it worse. Uh, you need to explain that, explain the risk to your patients. The other thing you could do is uh, start off using something else first to try to get things healed up first before actually ta tackling the, uh, the the infection itself with, with a herd like golden seal. Okay. Um, now, one of the big issues, my front reception is getting rowdy out there. One of the big issues with um, most alkaloids, you have to use caution with pregnancy. And the isoquinoline alkaloids have a very strict contraindication during pregnancy, and that goes with golden seal, barberry, oregon grape, uh, some Chinese herbs like coctus. Um, so don't mess around with that. Okay. Now, one last thing with the golden seal is it is a North American herb exclusively, Hydrastis canadensis. I assume that means because it was originally found in Canada. So this was a First Nations herb. I'm going to send you some link for some little. Um, Summary mod, uh, right next I wrote on a couple of these guys, these herbs for this course uh, that are on the web, and I'll post those and, and uh, you can read up a little bit more if you want. It might help you remember these things. So, the reason why I'm not giving you what the indications are is because you should be able to figure it out based on these main indications, okay, by deduction. Less things to memorize, better to understand than to have to memorize everything, okay? Now, Barbary, so this is Berber's Vulgarit. Uh, I like this photograph. I took this one. This one is one that was growing wild. I'm pretty sure it's Berberus vulgaris, although I was reading something that shows I was saying that this is not native to North America, so I don't know if it's the same species. It was growing wild, though, so um, a bunch of these grow up wild by my cottage. So in the Middle East, often barberry, these little berries are used in uh, cuisine kind of a tangy, sour, like a little berry is used in certain dishes. Beyond that, it's not really used as a food source. The berries are a little bit. The rest of the plant, the roots and the bark contain isoquinoline alkaloids like bourbon. It doesn't contain um, hydrastine, so it's a little bit different. The advantage of barberry over golden seal is it's much easier to use it herbally if you're going to grow this and, and extract it because you don't have to kill the whole plant in order to get enough of the herbal product to make your tincture with, okay? Unlike golden seal, where once you harvest the plant, um, the roots, you've killed it. Barberry, you can just sort of trim it away and get little bits, and therefore it's a lot less expensive to buy. Like golden seal, the main compounds are ice cleanly and alkaloids, it contains the flavonyl ligands. So if you look at the indications here, it's identical to what I've listed for the golden seal. And because phytochemically, it's almost identical. Now, it's used for diarrhea. It's used for infections. It's used as a digestive tonic. Both golden seal and barberry can be used as a digestive bitter and also can be used as an antilithic for a gallstone. So even though I didn't write down uh, barberry and golden seal are antilithics, and I may not have written that down for um, uh, gentian, you can deduce that because it has that cholagogen cholerotic effects, okay? It also is contraindicated during pregnancy. So when you're learning the monographs, 
they're very similar, if not identical, the golden seal to the Barbary. Barbary tends to grow in, uh, was native to Europe, and they have different varieties that grow in the Middle East and in Asia. Uh, Berberis vulgaris means common, okay? Vulgar means common, okay? Like acne vulgaris is common acne. It's not vulgar like it was in offensive, okay? Um, in my opinion, I think Barbary is not as good an antimicrobial as uh, gold seal. I think gold seal is a really good one, but it's expensive, hard to find uh, in the wild. Uh, commercially, it's grown. Um, uh, it's grown commercially, not wild crafted, generally speaking, but it's, it's good. Tara's asking, do you want us to know the Latin names for the herbs? So for the final, there'll be five or six questions with where you need to know both the genus and the species for only the herbs of this lecture, okay? Not any of the other herbs that we've talked about uh, in the, uh, the safety lecture or the, uh, the final lecture where it's the herbal preparations. You don't have to know any of the Latin names for that, only for the ones that we're doing for the GI system. Eventually you have to know every single Latin name for every single herb that you study. So for now, but be, what is the verbal name for Barbary? Is it Hygrassus canadensis, Berberus vulgaris, Berberus canadensis, or you know, whatever? And so there's not that many herbs, you gotta memorize them, okay? Uh, so golden seal, Barbary, Oregon grape, to me, same monograph, but I think golden seal is better, it's more concentrated. Now, some herbalists will use barberry, uh, like some North American herbals might end up using Oregon grape or barberry as a digestive tonic because gentian lutea is not something that grows in uh, North America, so they don't have access to it. Some traditional herbalists prefer to use herbs that grow locally. And so that may be one of the indications why, you know, if you went to a herbal college, they may be, their gallstone formula may have more barberry in it than gentian. And just because of the accessibility of the herbs and cost, okay? Um, so the next herb is classified as an antilithic. Now this is a herb that grows in uh, South America. It's a tree. The leaves have a lot of aromatic essential oils in it. And the bark tends to have the bitter compounds in it. Now, when you look at the bitter properties in it, those bitter properties are associated with isoquinoline alkaloids, like boldine, okay? So I hope to make some berberine in the plant as well, I suspect. Uh, I don't want to say that for certain because I can't remember, but I, I believe I remember seeing somewhere that it contains berberine and some berberine-like compounds. And boldine is one of those compounds that has that effect, okay? And so, it's used historically in uh, herbal medicine, and especially in South America, as a digestive tonic, just like gentian, organ grape, golden seal herb. It's used as an antimicrobial because of the isoquinoline alkaloids. And that bitter property is used to promote digestion. It's used for gallstones. It also is used for skin conditions. And a lot of the, I would say, bitters in general would have that property. I didn't include hepatic here, but you probably could throw that down there for an indication for it as well. Um, the essential oils in it, which I haven't listed. Um, remember when we are talking about artemisin way back when, when we were talking about antivirals? And artemisin had a peroxide bridge. And those peroxide bridge structures are relatively unstable and generate free radicals. Boldo has an essential oil that has a peroxide bridge in it. And that may be one of the reasons why it's indicated as an antiparasitic because the essential oils alone have a bit of an antiseptic effect. And then these, uh, this one particular essential oil that's in it is relatively toxic and so it can have that uh, antimicrobial effects. So I've used this to dissolve gallstones. I've used it in combination with other herbs. And I've also used other combinations for gallstones that didn't include boldo. 
And so when I first graduated, I remember it being really good for golf. So, so it's one of the main herbs I use for that. I don't use it as much anymore. I don't have it in the clinic right now. I think it was, there was a period where St. Francis wasn't making it, one of the herb suppliers, or we couldn't get access to it, so I just stopped using it. Uh, but it is indicated. I think it also has an antispasmodic effect that I didn't write down here, and that's related to this uh, essential oil. So it wouldn't be wrong to add in carminative and antispasmodic to this as well because of those essential oils that are in it. And certainly, I don't really think of golden seal, barberry, and gentium as having a lot of essential oils in it. And if you, I took this photograph, not in South America, I actually took it when I was in Italy. Uh, uh, Padova has a huge herbal garden and uh, with herbs all around the world. And it's out of one of the teaching um, uh, medical schools there. And I remember picking the leaves and smelling it and, and tasting it. And uh, I was surprised at how aromatic it was. So if you go on with Boldo, it's kind of like the Oregon grape, Barberry, Gentian, it's a digestive bitter, uh, used for gallstones, has a little bit more of an antimicrobial properties for it. And um, in particular, it's used historically for gallstones, okay? So wormwood, Artemisia absinthium, is the infamous herb that's one of the main ingredients in absinthe. So absinthe liquor is made from wormwood. And that, I can't remember if I have any pictures now, that will be mentioned again during the safety lecture that Dr. Pickles had uh, uh, lecture for me. So the reason why absinthe was consumed by people, so it was very popular during the Impressionist age, uh, people would drink it. And what's interesting with it is that it was very bitter and they had combined it with fennel. So it had this bitter black licorice sort of taste with the fennel and the anise that they added to it. And the alcohol acts as the depressant, but it contains a thuyone. The thuyone is uh, an essential oil also found in sage, cedar, um, sage, cedar, wormwood are the main ones I can think of. And that compound actually uh, is a stimulant. So if you've ever heard of things like benzodiazepines, Valium. So Valium basically blocks, uh, sorry, uh, stimulates the uh, the GABA system in the body to have a calming effect. Okay, it could do it via benzodiazepine receptors or by directly binding the GABA receptors. And what thuyone does in wormwood is it blocks that system. So it acts as a stimulant. And so it gets the nerves to fire more. And when you get nerves to fire more, small amounts can make you more alert. So it's kind of like being drunk and drinking a whole bunch of coffee where the alcohol makes you depressed, your nervous system depressed while the caffeine is a stimulant. So thuyone combined with the alcohol has that effect. In addition to that, it may have had some slight uh, psychotropic effects, not a true hallucinogens, but it may be that certain compounds in it alter perspective. And, and uh, when you look at the artwork done by the impressionists like Van Gogh, they're all kind of yellowy green halos around things and kind of a bit blurry. And that may have been inspired by some of the um, effects of drinking absinthe. The problem with absinthe is that thuyone, which is a stimulant, is also a neurotoxin. So generally speaking, if you overstimulate certain things in your nervous system, it tends to have toxic effects. And so a low dose, it acts as a mild stimulant. Higher doses, it can cause like acute poisoning, can result in muscle twitching, uh, overstimulation of the muscles that could then lead to um, convulsions and even death. Okay. So if you took a teaspoon of, of the essential oil from wormwood, it would kill you, okay? A teaspoon from peppermint oil probably wouldn't kill you. It might hurt a little bit, but it wouldn't kill you. I would say uh, taking it from wormwood or cedar oil or uh, sage would be very, very dangerous, okay? Um, so that gives you a little background on wormwood to herb. So you can buy absinthe liquor at the LCBO, but the thuyone content is strictly regulated and will not have enough to have 
the full effects is if you bought wormwood a couple hundred years ago in Europe, or if you go to Eastern Europe where laws are more lax, you can still buy it in countries like Czech Republic and, and uh, areas like that. <clears throat> so now wormwood, when you consume it as a herb, you're not drinking several glasses of it on a daily basis long term. Okay. That's where you get into some problems with it. So lots of wormwood consumed on a regular basis makes you a little crazy. And if you remember what happened to um, Van Gogh, uh, he suffered from, from some mental health issues. Um, you know, at one point he cut his ear off and sent it to some girl that he was obsessed with, thinking that uh, that would be a great way to prove to her how much he loved her, you know. Um, and I mean, it's impressive, his, his commitment and dedication to her. But, um, you know, I don't think most people would appreciate the sentiment. So, um, and I think he ended up taking his own life at some point in his career. And so uh, I think he was probably predisposed out of some mental health issues, but we do know that a lot of the impressionists who drank it, like it wasn't a fun thing. It kind of, I don't, I don't know how it was addictive, but people drank a lot of it and they ended up getting some depression and, and uh, some mental health issues with it. Okay. Now the safety around this, I would not want to give this high amounts long term to someone if they were suffering from depression, uh, if they were predisposed to seizures, like if they suffered from epilepsy, this would probably increase the risk of having a seizure. So seizure. So wormwood, sage, uh, and cedar would all be off the table. I would say don't do that. With pregnancy, you don't want to do any kind of neurotoxins in general. Just not a good idea. Okay. So Definitely some safety concerns with this. Now, historically, what wormwood was used for, no surprise, is as an antidepressant. So I didn't write down the indications, but you can deduce it by the action. So it's used to treat certain types of parasitic infections, including worms. Okay, it's also used as an aperitif and as a digestive because it has these bitter properties. Now, the bitter components associated with wormwood is associated with the absinthin, and absinthin is the sesquiterpene lactone dimer. So it's Remember when you hear lactone, it's a bitter. So ses sesquiterpene lactones um, are like the secoiridoids, but have an extra five carbons on there, and they're very bitter, okay? So wormwood has a lot of bitter properties that can be used to promote digestion. The thuyon and some of the other essential oils, like any essential oils, have a carbonative action. So, um, they can help relax. I mean, I think it's a dose dependent thing because too much of these things cause, too much thuyolins toxic and causes uh, muscles to overfire and become too much stimulation. But they do have a little bit of a carminative. The herb as a whole has a bit of an antispasmodic effect. And so in some herbal traditions, wormwood is specifically used for biliary colic when there's cramping in the gallbladder. And you have the bitter component that helps to get those, get the, the gallbladder to pump more effectively. And it also has the essential oil component that has a bit of a relaxing effect. Okay. Um, so I don't use it in all my gallbladder formulas. One, because it tastes pretty nasty. A lot of people don't like the taste of it. Uh, but I do use it for a combination uh, when people have colic in their gallbladder. Okay, so it's used as an antilithic as well. It does help to treat gall, gallstones like any of the bitter tonics could. Promotes gallbladder flow, makes more bile, uh, has that carminative effect. The other thing that's interesting about it is it has an anti-inflammatory effect. Now, it was used for inflammation in the, in the bowels, for certain types of diarrhea, for infections. Um, and there was one study that I looked at showing that it helped when people took wormwood regularly when they suffer from Crohn's disease, it helped to keep it remission. So whether that's because it's had, exerting some influence on the gut flora or whether it directly has an anti-inflammatory effect, it may be that the sesquiterpene lactones like the absinthin helps to decrease inflammation and modulate immune function in a way that helps to keep people in remission who've got Crohn's. So that would be an option to use in people with Crohn's, providing they're not trying to conceive and they don't suffer from epilepsy, okay? And I think the dose you'd be getting on a daily basis would be significantly lower than the amount of thuyone that um, 
people like Van Gogh were consuming on a daily basis, okay? So that's where I'm looking for it. Any questions on that? Um, and just as an aside, sesquiterpene, lacto sesquiterpene lactones found in wormwood are also other types of sesquiterpene lactones are found in other members of the Asteraceae family. And the Asteraceae family will also include herbs like um, um, chicory, dandelion, even common lettuce, and all those contain sesquiterpene lactones. Okay, any questions? So, chicory, who's in the same family, it's a very safe digestive bitter, and it, and you can find it anywhere. Like it grows wild all over the place. Now, if you go into the uh, grocery store, there are different varieties of chicory that are often sold. Um, I believe endive is. I can't remember what the variety is, but they're different varieties and some of them can be different species of chicory and they have lactucin in it. Lactucin is also found in lettuce. So romaine lettuce, that white latex that you often get at the base of the stem uh, comes out when you break it and it's bitter. Uh, and iceberg lettuce too, although it's very, very low. I mean, iceberg lettuce does have health benefits. It's got flavonoids in it um, and it also has lactucin. So the reason why salads are so good for you is because of the flavonoid composition and because of some of these sesquiterpene lactones. And I think these have an anti-inflammatory effect in the body, a, a little bit like how um, most of these sesquiterpene lactones can do that. So in general, chicory, the leaf can be consumed in salads. The roots can be extracted using, a, uh, using alcohol, or it can be roasted and drunk as a decoction or as like a coffee substitute. So historically, chicory root would be roasted and coffee was adulterated with it because coffee was very expensive and chicory is so cheap that they kind of cut it with it so that they could water it down without people realizing. Nowadays, people are like, oh, I should be eating more chicory. And I find that I think it's chicory sometimes costs more to buy than coffee does just because of supply and demand and everything else. But um, in theory, it should be dramatically less expensive. Um, so it's a bitter, stomachic, colodon, choleretic, works on the liver. In the ancient Greeks, so Galen uh, was one of the ancient Greeks referred to chicory as friends of the liver. And the nice thing is because it's so inexpensive and accessible to people, you could be consuming this on a daily basis. Unlike the wormwoods, Unlike golden seal, barberry, I wouldn't want to consume those guys regularly on a daily basis. But chicory um, will be very safe. And although there are, probably aren't a lot of safety studies conducted with chicory in pregnancy, I certainly wouldn't be concerned with people eating endive or chicory leaf or even having a little bit of chicory root coffee during pregnancy. A little bit probably wouldn't be a big deal because people have been consuming it for years. Higher amounts may be an issue. In general, bitter things you tend not to want to recommend them to uh, women when they're pregnant. But, you know, coffee, a little bit of coffee safe during pregnancy. Lots of coffee during pregnancy is not, but a little bit is okay. Um, it does exert some antimicrobial effects. That's more in like some of the in vivo trials that you look at. Uh, but it's not the main indication. Unlike golden seals are strong antimicrobials, the chicory is a lot more gentle. The other thing with the root of chicory is that it's high in inulin. Inulin is one of those prebiotics that gets fermented by your gut flora. So consuming chicory leaf and the root to a greater degree uh, will produce a lot of gas, but can have a positive effect on gut flora. So when you look at a lot of, in the food industry, chicory is sometimes added as a sub substitute or uh, as a, uh, um, an ingredient. I don't know why it may be, I don't know why they added it. Maybe it's a, uh, because of a fiber source, may have a bit of a uh, thickening action associated with it. But I find certain products that contain this uh, can cause some bloating and gas. And so, uh, and some people are even more susceptible to it. So someone on a low FODMAP diet where they're trying to uh, 
uh, avoid fermentable carbohydrates, chicory would definitely be something you would want to recommend to them. Uh, uh, Andrew is asking about the wormwood, the anthelmintic property. It's probably a combination of the essential oils and the sesquiterpene lactone in there. I suspect. Okay. So, dandelion grows everywhere. You can find this Asia, Middle East, Europe, North America. Grows like a weed. It is the definition of a weed. But like weeds, most weeds actually have a lot of medicinal properties. And dandelions, definitely one that I think is a, a, a fantastic herb. You can eat the leaf in salads. You could literally go into your front yard, assuming it wasn't sprayed or being peed on by dogs or whatever, and pick the leaf and consume it that way. At the grocery store, they often will cultivate it and have a different, slightly different variety so you get bigger leaves, uh, but they're still really bitter. Um, the root can be roasted and consumed like chicory. Um, both chick, any of these bitters, I think, can be used for gallstones, and dandelion would be uh, something that, although I would not put chicory or dandelion in my herbal tinctures that are alcohol extracts for gallstones, just because they're not as potent as some of the other ones, they're not as concentrated. I tend to use tinctures more for expensive herbs that I want to do a better extraction with. But if you wanted to drink these or eat, Eat the leaves or drink drink the concoctions made from the roots. These are great. Um, so, digestive bitter, stomachic, cold dog, choleratic, hepatic, both chicory and um, dandelion can indirectly be used for skin conditions. And that's because any of these bitters can be classified as alteratives. So, an alterative means something that cleanses the blood. And when you get the liver to work better, uh, and you support the the, uh, the uh, roots of elimination of the body it can help with skin issues. Also, because these sesquiterpene lactones that um, um, that are in these things, they have an anti-inflammatory effect. So maybe they exert an effect there locally, or maybe it's just distally in the liver. Um, so great herbs, easy to find, but not as strong as some of the other ones. And there is, I'm certain dandelion root has some antimicrobial properties, but it's not going to be as concentrated as golden seal. So I tend not to use them as antimicrobials. I didn't really list that indication, but they, they do have that indication as well. So liver, gallstones, promoting digestion, just general health as well. Uh, eating more bitters is good. So if you have a salad that contains romaine lettuce, even iceberg lettuce, got some chicory, some endive. All those have different types of uh, uh, bitter components, and they're going to have flavonoids in as well. And that's why eating salads are so good. Eat, you should eat one salad a day at the very least, okay? So I'm not going to go into all the indications for dandelion because it's kind of the same as the other bitters, okay? Now, globe artichoke is also in the same family as chicory and endive, but it's a little bit different. Unlike uh, dandelion that has a flower, globe artichoke is more like a burdock where it has a thistle-like structure to it. And this thistle, it's quite pretty the inside of it. All that nice yellow color in there is loaded with different flavonoids like apigenin. And apigenins um, found in uh, celery as well. Chamomile tea it has an antispasmodic effect, it has antioxidant effects, it helps to lower cholesterol, may help with blood sugar. So globe artichoke is used as a digestive bitter. That's one of the things that I can think of that it's used for, okay? Um, when you eat it, it doesn't taste as bitter as gentian is, but it still has some bitter properties. In it. It's kind of a milder bitter, like how uh, maybe the the Hickory might be in the end, and the lettuce might be more of a food type of bitter. Okay, yeah. the sesquiterpene lactones in it, like, uh, are likely responsible for the bitter taste to it. But even some of the other compounds, like caffeic acid and, and flavonoids, to some degree, do have some bitter properties as well. Um, it's a digestive bitter. Now, the classic indication for globe artichoke is more of a cardiovascular herb slash digestive herb. So 
Because it works on the liver, it increases bile synthesis. It also supports um, lowering cholesterol. So globe artichoke, I think it basically works, tells your body to make more bile, to release more bile, and I think it might maybe inhibit cholesterol synthesis as well. So it increases bile secretion and reduces cholesterol synthesis. That's what I think it does. So in addition to being a bitter, it has this hypolipidemic effect, meaning it lowers cholesterol, lowers lipids. And because of the uh, flavonoid composition, it actually helps to protect the arteries from atherosclerosis, meaning heart disease, by lowering the cholesterol and also increasing the antioxidants uh, that are in it that help to decrease inflammation and oxidative distress. Okay. So someone comes in, they have a history of heart disease. Consuming globe artichoke on a daily basis would have benefits of not just lowering cholesterol, but helping to prevent heart disease. And if someone could spend millions of dollars and do a huge trial, I suspect that these would show a lot of great health benefits. Now, apigenin, which is one of the flavonoids, it's in other things. See, globe artichoke is not the only thing you, you have to eat for this, but I use this for uh, patients with, I have it in one of my gallstone formulas and also a fatty liver formula. Uh, so I've used it for that. I use it for digestion indirectly. It's not my primary go-to bitter, but something that I'm giving people longer term, I like to include it in it if they have heart disease and also um, fatty liver and even blood sugar dysregulation. There's some studies that show that apigenin, at least some of the herbs that contain apigenin, may have some beneficial effects on lowering blood sugar. And I suspect that globe artichoke does that, but I'm not saying that with 100% confidence. So the take home with globe artichoke, it is a bitter, a little bit milder than some of them, but it seems to have that cholesterol lowering effect and protecting effect on uh, the cardiovascular system. Uh, and so that's kind of how I remember it being that archetypal uh, herb that works for lowering cholesterol fats and helping the heart in addition to working on digestion, okay? Now, chamomile is also a cousin of um, globe artichoke, endive, chicory. They're all in the same family. They all have these sesquiterpene lactoids, these are sesquiterpene lactones. So matricin is the one that's found in chamomile. And it has anti-inflammatory properties and vulnerary properties. And vulnerary meaning it helps to stimulate wound healing. It's used for ulcers. It's used for inflammation, irritation. And so chamomile is used both internally and topically for irritation and skin issues. Now, like globe artichoke, it contains apigenin. Now, one of the classic things for chamomiles Two indications that I think of when I think of chamomile, or actually three, there's a whole bunch of things. Chamomile is awesome because it's cheap. And you can buy this at pretty much any coffee, uh, any um, uh, uh, the uh, the time change is affecting my brain because I was up way too early this morning. Um, I was actually up about an hour and a half before. I was supposed to even on the new schedule because my son woke up and then I was scared that I was going to sleep in. So then I, I just was up since about 5 a.m., which is like God knows what time, old time, maybe 4 a.m. or whatever. So my brain's a little bit slow. So a coffee shop is also referred to as a cafe. That's what I was trying to think of the word. Um, they do that a little bit early on, said all time is going on. Anyways, so chamomile can be found in any cafe around the world, I'm sure, or almost any. We can get it at most grocery stores, it's so easy to grow, so widely accessible. It's an awesome herb, and you should drink lots of chamomile. So, classic herbal indication for it is colicky baby, a fussy baby with green stool. Green stool usually means that the, the transit time slow down, they're getting a little bit of uh, cramping pains, they're colicky, they're miserable because they're in discomfort. You get them chamomile because it helps to get their digestive tract to relax. And it also then helps to relax the baby because apigenin and some of these other compounds in chamomile have a mild sedative effect and works to decrease anxiety. I read one study that showed that it can help with general anxiety disorder. 
it's not as strong as things like Valium are, those benzodiazepine drugs. Uh, it's nowhere near to being as strong as that. But it works by some similar mechanisms, but in a very, very gentle form. And the nice thing about chamomile is you can drink one cup or you can drink 10 cups, and there's no safety concerns with it, really. Um, you can give the children, you can give the adults. Some studies have read is that it decreases heart disease risk and may help uh, improve blood sugar in diabetic patients. So that's kind of an off indication, presumably because of the antioxidants and everything else in it, maybe through the, the, the sesquiterpene lactones in it. Uh, so colicky baby, one thing. The second other herbal indication, especially the German her herbal indication, is it's revered for stomach problems in particular. Stomach meaning like gastritis, um, H. pylori infections. So some of the compounds of chamomile seem to have some anti-H. pyloric properties associated with it. It decreases inflammation, it helps to uh, suppress the stomach acid a little bit as well, and helps to heal stomach ulcers. So anyone who's got a stomach ulcer, not reflux per se, but a stomach ulcer, heartburn, taking too many ibuprofen, too much ibuprofen, has an H. pylori infection, getting them to drink chamomile on an empty stomach could really be beneficial for that, okay? So wound dealing, both internally and topically, uh, for colicky babies with cramping spasmodic pains, also diabetes, heart disease. If you don't like eating vegetables, then drink chamomile tea. It's a bit bitter, so I tend to recommend patients combine it with peppermint. If they had to add a little touch of honey, probably wouldn't be the end of the world, okay? Now, yarrow is interesting because, again, it is a cousin of chamomile, and it has almost identical compounds in it. It contains the sesquiterpene lactone matricin, which is also found in chamomile. It contains a lot of apigenin, which is also found in chamomile. It's used historically for wound healing. And one of the uh, indications, the Roman uh, army would apply yarrow topically to wounds to arrest bleeding. And that's what's called a styptic uh, or hemostatic and to help with wound healing. So it, I think it might be a little bit more stringent than chamomile is. I think of it being a little bit stronger for like a bleeding sort of presentation. It's also often used in herbal medicine, uh, in combination with other herbs for respiratory tract infections, uh, it does have some antispasmodic effects to it. It may be better for a diarrhea than chamomile is, but both chamomile and yarrow uh, are indicated for diarrhea. Chamomile, I don't know if I mentioned it before, at some traditions we indicate it specifically for childhood diarrhea. Um, it's often used in uh, the liquor industry as part of as like a bitter tonic as well. It's a little bit more bitter than the chamomile is. Chamomile definitely is bitter, but I find it has some more bitter properties to it. Uh, sometimes used for cardiovascular conditions to lower blood pressure. I think that's because of the apigenin is known to lower blood pressure. Um, so chamomile probably also lowers blood pressure as well. Okay. So lots of indications. I use chamomile more just because it's more accessible, but certainly yarrow is a great herb. I've used it in ulcer formulas as well. The question is, is it worthwhile combining both chamomile and yarrow in the same formula? I usually don't. I usually recommend yarrow more in tincture form with other herbs from treating gastritis or stomach ulcer, while chamomile I tend to recommend it more with peppermint to be consumed as a tea. That's just my preference, but you can do whatever you want, okay? And like I said, I think it's a little bit more astringent than uh, chamomile is, but phytochemically, very similar, but there are some different indications when you read about them, okay? Now, peppermint is the first herb in a while that is not in the Asteraceae family. It's in the mint family. And one of the differences, although a lot of the ones have some essential oils in it, peppermint is definitely rich in essential oil. And there are going to be flavonoids and other things in peppermint as well. But menthol is one of the main essential oils in peppermint. You will find this in other members of the mint family as well, but it's predominantly in, men in menthol, it's predominantly in peppermint. And... One of the main indications for peppermint is any kind of spastic 
digestive issues because it has a carminative effect, okay? And so um, there are research studies showing for irritable bowel syndrome. It helps to relieve some of the pain associated with IBS. And when you apply peppermint internally, it's gonna relax those smooth muscles. It also has a bit of an analgesic effect by stimulating the certain receptors in the body. So topically, when you apply menthol um, to your skin or in your mouth, it has that cooling-like action that can compete with pain signals going to the brain and, and reduce um, the sensation of pain. It may not necessarily get rid of the pain. It just, it just overrides it, kind of like, uh, and that's how sport creams work. When you apply the sport cream topically, you don't feel the muscle pain as much because that hot or cold sensation being produced by the essential oils, they override, they, they speak over top of the pain in the muscles. Kind of like if someone's trying to talk to you, you have someone else who's screaming in your ear, you can't hear the other person because your brain can't take in too many signals at once. It has to filter some things out. And so peppermint sort of helps your brain filter out the pain. Uh, so there are research studies showing benefit for IBS. Also studies show that when people are undergoing endoscopy or other kind of medical uh, exploratory procedures where they're putting scopes in people, uh, whether down the esophagus or uh, doing colonoscopy and other procedures like that, then it may help relax the smooth muscles, prevent some of the cramping and the discomfort that's associated with that. Another thing with peppermint is, although I think of ginger as being like the archetypal, the classic antiemetic, peppermint's a good, good second, good second, I think. Um, and you can buy peppermint tea as many places as you can get chamomile. Uh, ginger is pretty widespread too. Uh, so peppermint's great for that cramping, spasmodic, nausea, digestive upset. If you go traveling, take some, uh, you know, curiously strong peppermints with you so you can pop them in your mouth if you're feeling a little nauseous. Um, if a kid's got a tummy ache, you can give them, you know, a peppermint. Um, good options. It also has a slight anti tussin effect, meaning it helps to act as a cough suppressant. That's why a lot of um, cough drops will contain uh, peppermint in as well. The only problem with any of these essential oil rich herbs is you got to be cautious with GERD, okay? Now I just check the time, it's 10.44. Can you please come back at 10.55 and I'll continue from there. If you have any questions, write them down and we'll move on to another carminative herb, okay? So yeah, 10 minutes, come back please.
Uh, okay, guys. Hear and see me again. Oops. Okay, two things really quick. Um, I don't know if you saw this on the news. Quercetin, you guys have heard about that before. So they're basically going to be doing some studies on quercetin uh, for coronavirus and it might help with the coronavirus, which is kind of cool. Uh, so my advice is if you get coronavirus, you may as well buy some, take some quercetin for it. Okay, you guys see that? Uh, one second. Now, I've delayed slightly because what is it? I had, okay. So this is unofficial, but because everyone's wondering uh, what I did. These are the exam marks with the adjusted. So basically we had six people got in the 90s. One person got 100, just so you know. Uh, a bunch of people got between 80 and 90. A bunch of people got this between 70 and 80. Uh, two people kind of got right on this. I rounded it up, just so you know. And then there is this little spike of failures here. Um, so the average, now, there was one person who got 25%, but what I suspect with that is statistically, it's more likely that they put in the wrong version code on the exam. So if I don't include that person, the class average is 78 after I've lowered the mark. So we've got a lot of people who did really, really well. Like the majority of the class got in the 80s and then even the 70s to 80 range is pretty high. It's just a big, big number of failures, which I haven't seen that many before is dragging the average down and not helping everything. So, uh, so that's what it is. It's unofficial because I haven't, I haven't proved that anything, but, uh, certainly the statistics show it was a fair exam and that a lot of people did really, really well on it, but a bunch of people did not so good for whatever the reason is. So these guys are going to have to work harder for the midterm and hopefully they, uh, and if they don't pass, you know what? You write the supplemental. You figure it out. It's extra work for you, but so be it. Okay. Uh, any questions about either of those things? Do you guys? Are you guys hearing me? Anyone out there? Are you happy to see those? That distribution or is that stress? Yeah, probably stresses some of you guys out. Probably some of you are like, good, I did well. Okay. Look, it's not the end of the world if you fail the exam anyways. I just want you guys to learn stuff. I want my exam, I want everyone to get an 80 on the exam. And if you don't, just make sure you learn the stuff, okay? Uh, let's see how we go for time. So peppermint from the mint family. Fennel is from another family. And remember going back to the monoterpenes? Monoterpenes are high in the peppermint family. So when you read about peppermint, that also applies to oregano, to thyme, to spearmint, <coughs> to uh, marjoram, uh, all those herbs in that family. Fennel is in a different family, it's in the anise family the APACA family or Umbrellaceae family. It has this umbrella-like structure to the flowers. A lot of herbs in this family have that. So if you've grown dill in your garden, dill has that classic sort of presentation as well. And so members of this family, like the mint family, are high in essential oils. The difference is these are phenylpropenes, like anthol is the classic black licorice taste that you get in fennel, but you also will get it in herbs like anise, okay? so. Whether you're eating fennel, anise, caraway, dill, cumin, uh, the essential oil and celery, they're all going to have that permanent effect and a mild antispasmodic effect. Unlike some herbs that have more of suppressive action, these are pretty uh, gentle in the system. Fennel as a whole herb 
is going to have some different properties than fennel essential oil uh, on its own. One thing about fennel is um, it also has lots of different phenol compounds in it. So when you eat the root of fennel, if you've ever seen the bulb or, or uh, it's eaten as a vegetable, it's going to have other properties associated with it as well. One interesting thing about fennel is beyond the digestive tract, so it's used for obviously cramping and gas and bloating uh, as a digestive tonic. And if you go to an Indian restaurant, the seeds that you get on the way out, that contains fennel and anise and some other seeds. Uh, so it helps settle the stomach down and increases blood flow to the stomach. In addition to that, it can be used in certain cold formulas as an expectorant. It also has some mild, some phytoestrogenic properties and maybe some uh, hormonal regulating effects. So we know that it increases milk production. So it seems to modulate prolactin levels. It also can have a positive effect on uh, menstrual cramps, dysmenorrhea, which we're not talking about now, but just good to know about that. So I think of this being a digestive tonic. A lot of people like the taste of fennel. A lot of people hate the taste of fennel. So black licorice is a, you know, it's one of those flavorings that not everybody loves. So um, the take home here, digestive tonic with some of these estrogenic properties that may be beneficial for hormone regulation, menstrual pains, milk production, a few other things. Caution, don't want to overdo these in pregnancy and you don't want to overdo it in breastfeeding as well. So it's one of those things where a little bit is good, but you wouldn't want to take high amounts of this. This may have some disruptive effect on the nervous system. These essential oils you got to be careful with. So I'm not concerned about having a little bit of the tincture or a little bit of the tea um, or eating fennel ball, but if you're taking high, high amounts beyond the acceptable range, I think you'd want to be very careful about that, okay? In general, any little seeds like this that you find in your uh, herb drawers in your kitchen are gonna have carminative effects to it, okay? Now, Garden Angelica is also a member of the APACA family. This herb was used, uh, it's called Angelica Arch Angelica. It was used in early herbal medicine for uh, respiratory conditions and digestive conditions, okay? Um, historically, it was used to treat the plague. So the plague was uh, caused by Yersinia, a uh, type of bacterial uh, infection. Uh, it was used for that. I don't know how useful it was, but it was used for that. Uh, in modern day herbalism, it's used as a digestive tonic. It has both some bitter and carminative properties with it. It's found in certain herbal liqueurs like chartreuse, vermouth, certain types. Sometimes it will add it to gin and absinthe as well as a flavoring. Very pleasant, kind of a very aromatic herb. So you can basically use it as a digestive, bitter slash carminative. Okay. Um, it also may have some antidepressant effects, which is kind of interesting as well. So the essential oils are going to be the main components, and it also contains some coumarin and also some furanocoumarins. Now, the reason why I'm mentioning the furanocoumarins is that harvesting this can have two things. One, you get it on your skin, it can have a photosensitizing effect and could end up causing burns on your skin. The second reason why I mention it is if someone was taking certain medications like statin drugs and you get them, high amounts of furanocoumarins, it could potentially cause the grapefruit effect, okay? So the grapefruit juice effect is when the furanocoumarins elevate blood levels of the drug because it inhibits the breakdown. So even though I haven't seen any specific studies done on garden angelica, because I know it contains furanocoumarins, I would be concerned that there could be some, could be some issues with it interacting with drugs, okay? I'm not overly concerned with it, but just it's in the back of my mind. Now, with reflux, like any of the carminatives we talked about, whether it's peppermint or fennel, um, they're all going to cause reflux if you take too much of it, and then especially if you go lay down after a meal. So they're great herbs, but if you tend to get a lot of reflux before bed, don't go and have garden angelica, fennel, peppermint, things like that, right before you lay down to go to sleep, okay? Now, greater chalandine is in the poppy family, okay? And Chaldonium magus has a whole bunch of different alkaloids in it that, one, stimulate digestion as a digestive bitter. Two, 
They have a really strong effect on increasing bile production and bile release. Three, they have a strong antispasmodic effect. And like a lot of opiates, it does have kind of a mild, uh, unlike the carminatives that have a more of a normalizing effect on smooth muscles, certain drugs like opium, I would see, say even greater chalendine to some degree, has a bit of a suppressive effect on, uh, kind of has a little stronger effect than the carminative, so it's different. Um, historically, it's used as a liver herb, but ironically, case reports have shown that it can increase liver enzymes and cause drug-induced hepatitis in some people. So I don't use this all the time. I tend to only use it with people if I'm treating a spasmodic condition in the intestinal tract, like IBS or with biliary colic. So if I have someone coming with gallstones and they have a lot of cramping, spasming pains, I might give it to take acutely for the spasming or combine in the formula initially. But once the spasm is under control with diet and everything else, I may back off on the greater chalandine because of the concern that in some cases, and I think it's uncommon, but it still occurs, that it can cause uh, reversible effects, damaging effects on the liver. Um, and appreciate Tylenol damages the liver, but it's still the number one most recommended analgesic because it's safe usually although it causes a lot of liver failure and deaths it's still relatively safe everything has its risk so you know greater channel diet i don't think there's been any deaths reported with it i think there's been at least a dozen case reports of people having adverse liver uh problems with it so you got to use it with caution like any of the isoquinoline alkaloids when you hear that no pregnancy so this is a great herb. It grows wild. I like it. I use it mostly for spasmodic pain, sometimes with IBS pain, sometimes with gallbladder pains. Uh, it can be used topically also for warts because it has a bit of a, what's called an escoriatic effect. It can help burn off warts and have an antiviral effect. Um, but I caution using it long term. Uh, and that's my opinion. Okay. Wild yam, on the other hand, um, which is referred to as colic root, I feel much more comfortable including this in a herbal formula for gallstones and having the person take it long term. And several reasons why I like wild yam in, in, in uh, gallstone formulas is it has an antispasmodic effect and it also seems to have a cholesterol lowering effect and increases bowel flow as well. And so for people with a little bit of biliary colic, it can help relieve that cramping pain. Historically, it's also used uh, as a precursor for making synthetic estrogens. It does not contain estrogen, but it does have some phytoestrogenic properties to it, a little bit of a modulating effect, um, making it also useful for menstrual cramps as well. So the way I look at wild yam is it's good for cholesterol, fatty liver, gallstones, because it has that uh, lipid lowering effects and works on the gallbladder. But because of the cramping action or anti cramping, uh, the anti spasmodic effects that it has, I would also recommend it for uh, specifically when you've got uh, cramping of the smooth muscles, uh, whether that's in the gallbladder or whether that's in the intestinal tract or even in uh, the uterus. Okay. Now, milk thistle. Milk thistle seed isn't that bitter compared to a lot of the other digestive bitters that we talked about. I think you could probably argue that it does have some bitter properties to it, but it's just not a strong bitter. When I think of milk thistle, it's a classic, the classic hepatoprotective liver herb. So the flavonal lignans in it, like psilibin, it has a real protective effect and helps to lower liver enzymes. It also, I've read studies showing that milk thistle has beneficial effects on cardiovascular disease. And those antioxidants, all the flavonoids, everything else, help to lower cholesterol potentially, help to get bile flow going, help to protect the arteries from oxidative stress. So I think it's a good, even though it's a liver, it may also, like artichoke, have some benefits for the cardiovascular system. 
but it also started showing it has some anti-cancer effects as well. And like how Barberry have the uh, flavonoid ligands like 5-MHC that works as a multi-drug resistant pump inhibitor, psilocybin, the flavonoid in the milk thistle, which is responsible for the hepatoprotective effect, appears to have that similar action. And that's one of the reasons why it may be beneficial when you combine it with certain anti-cancer drugs. And a lot of oncologists would say, don't take any antioxidants when you're taking certain chemotherapeutic drugs. And I would say, if we don't know, then we shouldn't combine them. But if the research suggests that it's safe and that it might actually increase the, the effects of those drugs, then we should do it. And so I'm not sure where the research is right now with these things, but certainly animal studies have shown that. And some human studies may have maybe suggesting that maybe we should, should be combining it. So usually what I recommend is the first round of chemo I don't mess around with because uh, people respond well and that drops the cancer levels. But if, when they start becoming resistant to it, I would consider adding this into the mix, okay? I'm not telling you to do that. I'm just telling you to consider it. And if the research says that it's not good, then don't do it, okay? Don't rely on, um, you know, logic. Just because something's an antioxidant, and the chemotherapeutic drug is a pro-oxin doesn't mean that they're going to cancel each other out. They may actually help each other when, they, when they're combined, okay? So milk thistle, I'll use that in uh, formulas for hepatitis. So when there's inflammation of the liver, uh, it has some benefit for viral hepatitis. It's not, you know, not huge. There's other things I've used, but you could use it. But I do use it in my formulas for uh, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease or even people with, al uh, with alcoholic fatty liver disease or drug-induced hepatitis. Throwing that in your formula can benefit, okay? So marshmallow is a classic demulcent herb. It's one of my favorite ones because it's very inexpensive and it does the trick. Now marshmallow, the candy, was originally made from marshmallow, the plant. So they would basically take, do an extraction with all that soluble fiber that would make it all mucilaginous and slimy, and they'd add sugar to it and they make little balls of kind of slimy, mucusy, uh, um, sugary, sweet tasting candies, okay? And you know, not modern day marshmallows made probably from sugar and starch and a number of other things. It's not at all the same anymore, but they're, you know, they, it, it was once developed for marshmallows. So where we use marshmallow though, is that slimy mucusy uh, liquid that it produces when you add either the leaf or the root to, uh, to water is that forms that mucilage that when you drink it, it helps to coat the esophagus and protect it from irritation like reflux. So if you have heartburn reflux, drinking marshmallow as a infusion with cold water or hot water as a tea will protect the mucous membranes. And usually what I recommend for people with reflux is they take this and add it to water and they sip it throughout the day when they get reflux. You can take higher amounts uh, in tea or decoction form and drink it for things like gastritis as well because in addition to the mu mucilage, there are flavonoids that seem to have some anti-ulcer properties as well. So taking something like chamomile and marshmallow in combination for gastritis would be beneficial because you've got the mucilaginous effects of the marshmallow combined with the vulnerable effects of the, and some of the antacid effects of the chamomile would be, would be useful. Now, I don't tend to use marshmallow in tincture form, mainly because the properties that I'm trying to get is related to water soluble constituents. So mucilage is soluble in water. Flavonoids are somewhat soluble in water, so it's not wrong to use water as a solvent for those. If I buy a pound of marshmallow, it'll cost me about ten dollars, I would say. A pound of marshmallow is 455 grams. If I'm going to make a tincture out of that, and tinctures usually use uh, five part alcohol to one part herb, I'm looking at about 2.5 liters of marshmallow tincture that you can get from a pound of the leaf or root or whatever you're using. So 10 bucks for a pound of herb, for 2.5 liters of tincture, you're looking at hundreds of dollars. 
And if you're appreciate a small, like 100 mil bottle might cost, let's say $25. So at that rate, if you were to buy, uh, you know, 25 times that, I don't know, I don't feel like doing math this morning, but you get the point, it's expensive, okay? Um, so Marshmallow is cost effective. We buy it in either powder or leaf form and recommend it to the patients. Uh, I do have a formula that, that like a capsules that people can buy that has it with some slippery elm or a slippery elm marshmallow and a little bit of liquor so they can open the capsules up and put it in, in water. It's not as cost effective, but it's more convenient for some people. So the take home with this marshmallow is great for any kind of inflammation of the gastrointestinal tract. I use it for heartburn and reflux in particular, but it also has a cough suppressant effect uh, through some mechanism, whether it's direct or indirect, it helps to reduce coughing. Helps with sore throats as well. So if you've got like a respiratory infection, it's used for that. It's even used as a demulcent in the urinary tract. So for people who have irritated uh, mucous membranes in, in, in the bladder or the urethra, uh, demulcents like marshmallow are often given for that. I don't know how it exerts its effect, whether it's a reflex action or what, but it does seem to have some beneficial effects for that. For you guys, reflux heartburn would be the big ones. Slippery elm. Slippery elm is a lot like marshmallow. The difference is it's a little bit more expensive. It's probably about twice the price. So when you're buying bulk, if I buy a pound of marshmallow, uh, it's going to be half the price of slippery elm in pound form. I never use this in tincture form. Okay. The main constituents in it is mucilage. So like marshmallow, this is well suited for water extracts. Alcohol extracts would be overpriced and you're not going to get the therapeutic amount that you want. Okay. Um, it also has some tannins in it, a little bit of an astringent nature, but it's not, not too astringent, okay? But there is some. So like a demulcent, I tend to use slippery on more for inflammation of the GI tract. It has a better bulking agent. So it's a good bulk laxative. When you add it to water, uh, if I had like a spoonful of marshmallow powder to water, it turns into slimy water. If I did the same amount of water with uh, slippery on, um, it starts off as slimy water, but if it sits too long, it actually turns into porridge or jello. So by the early settlers, it was once consumed uh, as a food source. So in the spring or in the winter, if they ran out of food, they could go and use slippery elm and make a gruel or a porridge out of it that would actually be nutritive and sustain them. So for people that are suffering from like really bad inflammation in the GI tract and they can't eat anything, they're getting a lot of diarrhea, you could give them slippery elm uh powder and have them eat it like a porridge okay they might have to buy it like by the pound um but you could use it for that also topically you can apply it as poultices and slippery elm poultices were used to draw the pus out of wounds like abscesses and 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 topical uh, skin infections that have that drawing effect and the way that some of these poultices would work is when you apply uh uh a very high fiber substance uh, to the wound or to the to the infection, it acts as a sponge and pulls stuff out. Okay. Uh, someone asked a question. Can it also be used for reflux? Yeah, absolutely. So slippery elm can be used as reflux. There are some candies made from slippery elm on the market that you can basically suck on, and as you suck on it, your saliva will mix with it, forming a little bit more of a like a mucilaginous coating that can go down. And so I've used it for uh, those candies for reflux that people can suck on as a candy or for sore throats if you have a respiratory tract infection. Or the other indication I've used it for is that seems to have, seems to work pretty good is for people like singers who have like who lose their voice and they get a hoarse voice or they're doing a lot of practicing and they're getting a lot of raw and irritation of the, uh, of the, um, um, uh, speech vocal cords oh, my brain's slow the vocal cords i would recommend doing slippery elm as a adding some to water and just sipping it while they're singing or practicing or if they're on tour so i recommend that the musicians and they find it to be beneficial okay so flax you never give flax as a tincture okay how you administer flax to people is you get them to eat it every day as part of their breakfast you grind it up with a coffee grinder because you don't have a gizzard, so you, 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 unlike a bird, you can't break flax down. You must grind it to get 
the omega-3s out of it, they get the phenol compounds out of it. If you only want the fiber, like the mucilage, you could just soak it in water. You get the mucilage that way without getting any of the other components. But flax has so many healthy things in it that please, if you don't eat it, please start eating it every day. Okay, I got a question here. Uh, Slipping on pill supplements, is that okay for reflux to eat? Yes. What concentration is good for reflux? With reflux, uh, with the um, slippery arm, just add a little, like a teaspoon to water and then sip it or take a lozenge and suck on it. Both of those are good. Okay. So going back to flaxseed. So flaxseed is one of these things that the main phytochemicals, that have the three main things. One, it's got phenolic compounds called lignans that have a positive effect on inflammation. Uh, they can act as uh, antioxidants. Uh, they can act as uh, phytoestrogens. I didn't write it. Oh yeah, I did write it down there. Phytoestrogens, uh, that's one thing. The mucilage is soluble fiber. So when you add it to water, it bulks up and helps to bulk up the stool. So it's great to maintain regularity of the bowel. So if people are, tend to be a little constipated, throw some ground flaxing with their breakfast, that will give them a lot more fiber that is good for bulking up the stool. Also, if you tend to get a little bit of diarrhea, it absorbs the water and gives you better bowel control. So it can be used for both constipation and diarrhea. Uh, also, research shows that because it's a phytoestrogen and it has these hormonal-like properties, it appears to reduce the risk of both breast and prostate cancer, which is great. Also, because it's a phenolic compound, it's a polyphenol, it has all these wonderful antioxidant, anti-inflammatory effects, uh, so just a dozen million things and it's dirt cheap. I eat flax every single day. Uh, golden flax has higher amounts of the lignans apparently than, uh, brown flax. Also, when you grind up the flax, you're getting all those omega-3s that are very hard to find, um, in your diet. So from plants, chia and flax have the highest amounts in the seeds. And I would say that, uh, walnut and hemp have a really good amount as well. And then things like corn oils and most vegetable oils have, are void of omega-3s and super high in omega-6s, okay? Uh, some people say that you have to be careful with flax during pregnancy because of the phytoestrogens. Uh, that's theoretical. I have yet to find any research that shows that it is a problem. Um, I know my wife ate flax while she's pregnant and nursing with both our children, and seems like everything's doing what it's supposed to be doing with my son. So I'm not really worried about uh, it affecting, uh, causing any, suppressing any male attributes and enhancing any female ones. Okay, so I'm not concerned, but I, there is a theoretical risk because of the phytoestrogen. People hear phytoestrogen, they get all freaked out by that. So another good bulk lock step is psyllium seed husk. So when you look at the most probably widely recommended uh, laxative is Metamucil. It's a bulk laxative. It's not a stimulating laxative. The way that it works, just like flax, is it's rich in soluble fiber that when you add water, it expands. And that expansion bulks up the stool, stimulates stretch receptors to get things moving. So that's one of the indications. The other indication for it is for diarrhea. When I had Jardia when I was in India, I was, it was a very unpleasant time in my life. And I was alone in the middle of the Himalayas and probably going to the washroom about 12 times uh, that one night. And while waiting to get medication, I started taking psyllium. And what was amazing with it is instead of going 12 times, I was able to reduce it down to about six times. And instead of waking up in the morning, having soiled my sleeping bag because I had missed a trip to the washroom because I was so tired and going to the washroom so much, uh, I didn't lose any bowel control. And so um, it's very humbling when you lose bowel control, uh, no matter what age you are. So that was like the lowest point in my life. And I would say that psyllium made it a little bit easier for me, okay? Now, psyllium didn't get rid of the underlying cause of the infection, which is a parasite, but it did give me better bowel control. And so people who suffer from IBS, constipation, diarrhea, alternating constipation, diarrhea, it can benefit. Now, there is a warning that the FDA put out on psyllium that it can cause esophageal blockages if you take psyllium husk 
add it to water, insufficient amount of water, and then drink it because that's it. Kind of, it's like almost kind of chalky and chunky. And if you don't let it mix properly with enough water, and then you drink it, it could continue to expand, get stuck in your esophagus, and cause like a bit of a choking hazard. Okay, sounds worse than it is. Uh, if you drink lots of water with it, and I find that powdered slim doesn't seem to cause that as much as the uh, whole seed does. Uh, so you have to watch that. So esophageal blockages, the risk with that. The other problem is that there have been cases when people get Crohn's disease, there's a bit of a mixed message on whether you should give fiber. Fiber appears to have beneficial effects if you don't have serious episodes where there's like a narrow structuring going down in the bot bowels. And some fiber is good for that. But if you have like, if your bowels are all inflamed and you get these little uh, severe narrowing going on and you take a whole bunch of psyllium seed fiber in high amounts, bowls of fiber get stuck in the intestinal tract and can cause a lot of discomfort and pain and can be a pretty severe situation. I, I think there was one naturopath who recommended someone with Crohn's to take a whole bunch of fiber and they hurt the patient and the person playing the board and then there was you know, repercussions from that. Um, so I think depending on the progression of where you're at with the Crohn's, too much fiber could aggravate it, but there's research showing that fiber is also good for Crohn's. So it's sort of a, it's a complicated one, okay? So be cautious with that. The other thing I'd be cautious with it is that if you're acutely constipated and you haven't had a bowel movement in days, it's kind of like you've got already got a, got a bit of a blockage in your bowels. If you take a big bolus of fiber, even flax for that matter, if you take a whole bunch of it or a whole bunch of psyllium and it starts expanding at one end of the, of the bowel, it's going to cause a lot of movement. But the problem is if, if the stool is hard and dense and kind of stuck in there and you add a whole bunch more fiber behind it, it can make people feel really awful. It can cause a lot of bloating and cramping and discomfort and gas. and it may make things worse and better. So my advice is, if you're acutely constipated, don't take a lot of bulk laxatives. Uh, go with more with an osmotic laxative, some sort, or a stimulating laxative, okay? Because your main active ingredient in flax and chia is water-soluble, you don't use tinctures for it. You'd never use a flax tincture or a psyllium tincture to treat uh, irregular bowels because the compounds you want are water-soluble, okay? Flavonoids and phenol compounds do okay in alcohol, but not mucilage, okay? Another type of <coughs> plantago, so if you look at the Latin name, plantago psyllium is what produces psyllium husk. English plantain of greater plantain grows wild all over people's yards, forests, everywhere. It was introduced by uh, Europeans and now it grows everywhere. These are two herbs that are used both internally and topically for wound healing, uh, for ulcers. So some books refer to plantain as uh, a rainbow, uh, a rambo. So rambo, you know, the, uh, the movies with Sylvester so Stallone. Uh, the idea is that you uh, injure yourself, you chew on the leaves of plantain and then stick it on there when you're out in the wild and it will help speed up the healing. It's also used topically for insect bites and other types of wounds. Internally, it can be consumed uh, for GI ulcers. Um, it has a number of anti-inflammatory properties associated with it and the mucilage, so it's quite beneficial. Plantains are also used. Now, I want to say that pl this plantain is not the same as bananas, you know, the plantain bananas. Same name, different thing altogether. So English plantain or greater plantain, uh, are both used interchangeably for stomach ulcers as an antispasmodic, so if there's cramping going on, uh, if there's any kind of cough, um, lots of different compounds in it that work in various ways. It's good, easy to find, wildly accessible. Uh, I like these herbs. Um, so it just, it's also used topically in plantain creams for eczema. Uh, and various types of dermatitis, okay? And that's common greater plantain that you'll find in your garden. And these will all produce seeds that you could use the whole herb just like you do with 
um, or just the seeds. If you use just the seeds, I imagine it would be a lot like um, psyllium. It would have that bulk laxative effect. So the plantain, marshmallow, slipperium, they all have significant mucilage. So they act as demulsants, okay? So they can all be used for heartburn, reflux, uh, inflammation in the bowels, things like that. Licorice is also a demulsant. But what's interesting about licorice is it does not contain mucilage. I've already said this at least two or three times before. So the way that licorice works is unlike slippery elm, marshmallow, when you add it to water, it doesn't form slime. It contains a, a uh, flavonoid called lycoflavonoid. That what it does is it, did I write it down? No, I wrote it down in the other lecture. What it does is that it stimulates mucus production. So instead of supplementing with mucilage, it indirectly provides more mucus by stimulating the production, by targeting uh, COX-1 enzyme and increasing the amount of certain foster glands involved with mucus formation. Licorice has so many indications. When you read about the monograph, there's pages and pages of the, the monograph on it. It's used as an adrenal tonic. It's used as an antiviral. It's used as an anti-inflammatory. It's used as a demulsant. Like, it does all these crazy things. It's used as a phytoestrogen. It's used for menstrual cramps. It's used for, uh, like, the list goes on and on. Uh, respiratory conditions. So for the GI tract, where I use this is if there's inflammation in the stomach and even inflammation in the intestinal tract. So if someone has gastritis and H. pylori infection, if they have a little reflux going on, I might use it as well. If they have uh, leaky gut syndrome going on, if they're taking medications like NSAIDs, anti-inflammatory drugs, that would be the classic thing is it's a demulsant and an indirect one. So I've combined marshmallow with licorice or slippery elm with DGL. Uh, and DGL is the extract of it that you can buy, or you can use the whole herb. I've used both kind of combinations of it. Um, so one coats your esophagus, the other one increases mucus production, and that can benefit. It's also found in a lot of different formulas for uh, hepatitis, when there's inflammation in the liver, it seems to have a hepatoprotective effect and an anti-inflammatory effect. And so I've used it in people with, uh, in formulas, not on its own, but in other formulas, for patients with different types of hepatitis, whether it's a viral hepatitis, because it also has some antiviral properties. Uh, just as a side note, um, the licorice was studied years ago for SARS, and SARS is, is very similar to the coronavirus is going on right now. Um, and they found that when they tested a whole bunch of natural antivirals, uh, licorice was more effective than the pharmaceutical drugs because uh, uh, they tested against um, ah, my brain today is awful. Um, I'll think of it in two minutes, sorry. Um, so it's better than the anti antiviral drugs, okay? Also because um, it increases the mucus production, not just in the respiratory tract, but it also increases secretions in the respiratory tract and the gastrointestinal tract. And by doing that, it helps to loosen up phlegm that's stuck in it. So for respiratory tract infections, it, has an, it decreases inflammation in the lungs, helps you cough up the phlegm, has an antiviral effect, so if you've got influenza, coronavirus, H1N1, any of those things, I would be using licorice tea, uh, uh, not just DGL, but licorice tea for that, okay? Now, as an aside, because it increases muc mucus production by targeting certain prostaglandins, those same prostaglandins that it elevates to help with mucus production are also used in the uterus to stimulate uterine contractions. So DGL, which is really safe because it doesn't affect blood pressure, might still have a slight uterine stimulating or, or may stimulate uterine contractions. So it's contraindicated during pregnancy. I'm not convinced it's an issue. It's more of a theoretical warning, but just in case, I would avoid it during pregnancy. Okay. Uh, so it's, it's an awesome herb. Licorice is 
it does everything. It's, you got to be careful with it. I wouldn't take it on a daily basis if you don't need to, but it's a very, very complex herb that does a lot of different things, partly because of the lycoflavone, lycoflavone compound in it, partly because of the glycerizin in it, partly because it has other flavonoids as well. So, uh, you know, eventually read the whole monograph on these guys. It's good. So licorice, H. pylori, stomach ulcers, Leaky gut is what I'd use it for. Marigold is not a demulcent, but what it does do is it acts as a balneary. So like chamomile, it has an affinity for inflammation, ulcers, and things like that. Marigold is like a classic herb. You apply it topically if you've got burns or if it could be included in skin products, skincare products for eczema. Um, you can apply it to cuts, burns, wounds, things like that. You can also take it internally. It would work in a different way, but synergistically, along with things like licorice, chamomile, for stomach ulcers. So even though I tend to think of this as like the archetypal herb you use for burns and wounds and cuts and things like that, internally, it can help with stomach ulcers, okay? Uh, unlike the other herbs that we talked about, the main compounds are probably what are called triterpenoids. These calendulosides are these uh, glycosides of these um, different triterpenoids appear to exert that anti-inflammatory vulnerable properties associated with it. It does have a little bit of an antimicrobial effect. So this is not a major herb I use for the GI tract, but if there's inflammation in the stomach or maybe if you want to try treating something like colitis with it, it might have some benefits along with some other herbs, okay? Meadow sweet. Um, meadow sweet is when I think of it, I think of one thing: natural antacid. This is used for people with uh, with different types of heartburn. Is the primary indication. Okay, it seems to inhibit uh, acid production through a couple different mechanisms. It may reduce the amount of histamine that's being produced, which histamine is a messenger for stimulating HCL production. It may, some of the tens might directly inhibit acid release. Um, so this is used for stomach ulcers. If someone came with H. pylori, this would be one of the herbs I would want to give them with other things. Um, it's also been shown to have some anti-H. pylori properties, so it does inhibit the growth of H. pylori. Um, so Perfect for stomach ulcers and heartburn if you don't know what's causing it. I don't use it very often because I don't see a lot of patients with heartburn. I don't, wouldn't, it wouldn't be my go-to if someone had a reflux because I'd rather use demulcents and, and bitters rather than using an antacid like this. But it, it certainly is indicated it will give some, some relief. So it's not my go-to. It's more for gastritis would be the main thing that I would be using, especially if it's H. pylori related. Okay. It's also a good way to wean people off of an antacid drug. You could use something like Metasweet as a tea or in tincture form. Uh, it does contain uh, salicylic acid glycosides. So like, these are the kind of the similar to what you get in, uh, in aspirin, which is a modified uh, salicylic acid compound. The irony is, is that although aspirin causes stomach ulcers, Meadow sweet seems to treat stomach ulcers. And so there are other things in meadow sweet that have a protective effect. And so you can use meadow sweet for arthritic conditions and for treating fevers. And you don't have to worry as much about it damaging uh, the intestinal tract. So I don't know what all is in the whole herb, but that would be an example of a herb that seems to have multiple phytochemicals working synergistically, some to reduce the side effects caused by others. You know, so it's like a uh, a cocktail of phytochemicals that work together as a team. And so aspirin, without a doubt, will cause stomach ulcers, and metal sweet seems to decrease the inflammation and not cause it, which is kind of cool, okay? So the only main indication I use this for is primarily for stomach ulcers, although there are some in indications for fever um, and inflammation as well. Agrimony is a herb I don't use a lot in practice. Um, some of the classic indication is for what's called a grumbling appendicitis. Uh, when there's inflammation and mucus in the intestinal tract, for 
for stomach ulcers, you could use it. For um, diarrhea, you could use it. And there's a whole bunch of different compounds, and it has a mixture of hydrolyzable tannins, volatile oils that would probably have some antispasmodic effects, carminative effects. There's some astringency to it that's going to help with healing ulcers and inflamed tissues. It has a bit of a digestive bitter effect as well. The all the different phytochemicals have not been as well elucidated on what how it's working. So it's a herb used historically that I think there's value in using it for sure, but less research to support it. So I tend I tend to, to use it less in practice. Um, although in the future maybe I'll end up using it more. One thing I can say about it is because of the astringency, you have to watch it for nutrient absorption. That goes for anything that's very very astringent. Now. Cranesville is essentially could be used interchangeably with oak and witch hazel. Okay, well, oak and witch hazel, I tend to think of it being more of a topical astringent, and Cranesville, I tend to think of more of an internal astringent, but they can all be used both internally and topically, and it's very astringent. Cranesville is first used by indigenous people, it grows well in North America. It's a type of geranium uh, that grows in wooded land, and the roots. Uh, in particular, very, very stringent. If you've ever gathered this, this one I took uh, in the forests around um, the Royal Botanical Gardens in Hamilton. And uh, when you pick the roots and you put it to your mouth, you'll find it's very, very stringent. So it's a pure stringent that has a lot of uh, um, uh, a lot of tannins in it. Now, where you can use this is Crane spills are often used in formulas for gastrointestinal inflammation, uh, stomach ulcers, things like that. It's going to be more suppressive than things like chamomile. Chamomile you can drink every day. Crane spill, you don't really want to use it a lot because it's such a strong astringent herb, just like oak or witch hazel. Not something you want to use in high amounts long term, okay? Now, the tannins in it also denature the uh, proton pumps, the, the acid forming uh, uh, enzymes in the intestinal tract, so it will naturally have an antacid effect. And I'd say most astringent things will have some antacid effects too. Uh, also suppress inflammation. So diarrhea, inflammation in uh, the mucous membranes is what you use it for, uh, but don't overdo these things. Like I said, same thing as the oak and the witch hazel, they're loaded with hydrolyzable tannins. Too much is just not gonna make you feel good, okay? Now, bilberry is also considered an astringent, but it's a lot more gentle. And in the German herbal tradition, it would be used for infantile diarrhea. That's one of the indications internally. Because the condensed tannins, although they're astringent, and bilberry is probably about five times more astringent than normal blueberry is. Um, and so you can use the powder, add a little water to it, or in capsule form, and then take it for it as a very gentle anti-diarrheal, okay? Um, so those anthocyanidins or condensed tannins that are in it um, exert that astringent effect, okay? Beyond that, it's also been used historically for eye issues and some other things, but with the GI tract, we're talking about primarily for diarrhea, okay? Ginger, we talked about it several times. It's a classic antiemetic. That's the main indication. The herb contains gingerol. Gingerol, the way it exerts its anti-emetic uh, properties is it suppresses 5-HT3 receptors. So that's a specific type of serotonin receptors in the gut. That same serotonin receptor, when you stimulate it, it causes nausea and vomiting, and it also causes anxiety. What's pretty cool about ginger is it works for a nervous stomach because it helps calm you down as well as directly affecting um, uh, uh, nausea and vomiting. In addition to that gingerol compound, there are lots of different essential oils that you can get in the root that have therapeutic effects and will act as a carminative. So it has both a carminative effect and this uh, antiemetic effect with it. Now, ginger is sometimes referred to as a pungent bitter. So it has a lot of the digestive promoting effects, the aper aperitif effects that you might get with a bitter, but uh, it increases circulation, promotes digestion, but it doesn't taste bitter. Now, I've read some studies that suggest it might actually lower stomach acid, but it may have other 
increase circulation of the stomach. So I'm not quite sure. It probably works through different mechanisms than you would expect uh, a class of bitter to. The other benefit is because ginger is a phenolic, gingerol, which is in ginger, is a phenolic compound, in addition to interact with serotonin receptors, that gingerol compound exerts an anti-inflammatory effect and also stimulates bile production. So anti-inflammatory effect means that it's going to be useful for taking ginger in your diet. It's going to help reduce some pain and arthritic pain as you get older. It's going to promote digestion. It's going to have that antioxidant effect. It may help with different inflammatory bowel conditions. Um, it may help with colitis. It also has some positive effects on the liver to increase bile production and bile release. So it does lower cholesterol. Um, it does have positive effects on protecting the liver because it's an antioxidant. So lots of great indications. So for people going through chemotherapy or someone who's pregnant, who's getting morning sickness, those would be two classic indications to use ginger. You can use a whole herb, you can use powder, you can use capsules, uh, tincture, caution, it can be really, really spicy. And sometimes it's too spicy to take because the alcohol uh, is really good at absorbing the ginger, the ginger all, the phenol compound, and it can be too pungent, too spicy for some people. Okay. Now, both turmeric and ginger are rhizomes. And what that means is if I break off a chunk of this root, another plant will grow up from it. So it's a specialized root. So turmeric and, and ginger are cousins of each other. They both contain phenol compounds. Curcumin contains a polyphenol called curcumin, and it's one of the best anti-inflammatories. Now, I want to say that turmeric root, in addition to containing curcumin, also has essential oils in it that exert some medicinal properties. It also contains carbohydrates, and these carbohydrates in it have been shown to exert anti-inflammatory effects as well. So the whole herb of turmeric is going to work as an anti-inflammatory. And some, a lot of the uh, natural food industry will say, oh, curcumin as a whole plant, you know, powdered turmeric is not well absorbed. Their curcumin is not well absorbed. So, you, you know, you got to buy our products to get the benefit. I would argue and say well, that's partially true. But we know that some of the benefits of turmeric may be related to the fact that it has these carbohydrates that have immune modulating antioxidant effects. Uh, immune modulating anti-inflammatory effects. It may be that the curcumin, it's not just the curcumin that has an, an action, but we know that polyphenols are broken down in the digestive tract by gut bacteria. And by feeding certain gut bacteria, you can have an immunomodulating anti-inflammatory effects. Also, when you break down curcumin, some of the these polyphenols may be broken down into simple phenolics that are easier to absorb and may exert some anti-inflammatory effects. So I'm not convinced that turmeric in um, whole herb is inferior to a curcumin supplement that has buyer better, greater bioavailability. Um, I'd love for people to do studies on that. Um, we carry both, literally sell, I can sell like a, a one pound bag of turmeric powder to patients for $30. That'll last them for six months or more. Or, for fifty dollars, send them, sell them a highly absorbed form of curcumin that will only last them a month, and I give them both options. Okay. Um, so, in addition to acting as an anti-inflammatory for various uh, things like colitis, Crohn's disease, um, you could also use turmeric uh, for preventing heart disease, for arthritic conditions, and it won't cause stomach ulcers. It also has been shown to exert an antidepressant properties comparable to conventional antidepressant drugs. And I'd much rather take turmeric as an antidepressant, which has all these side benefits of preventing heart disease and cancer and may help with diabetes and do all these other awesome things, than take an antidepressant that makes people overweight and causes erectile dysfunction and other sexual dysfunctions, right? So turmeric is awesome. Another herb, top five herbs you really want to know a lot about. It exerts some antimicrobial effects, has some carminative effects, protects the liver. So it's a good one. I don't tend to use it in tincture form as much as I just get people to, to buy the powder or take the capsules of it. Uh, I'm almost done. I'm going to go over. Just got a few more slides to get through. If you got to go, go and you can watch the end of it, but it won't take me long. It'll take me under five minutes. 
to go through this. Indian frankincense, the main active ingredient is boswellic acid. Boswellic is a really important anti-inflammatory. So it's used in formulas for arthritis, but also it appears to have some properties for certain types of inflammatory bowel diseases and asthma. Unlike some of the other anti-inflammatories that work on the cyclooxygenase enzyme, COX-2, it works on lipoxygenase enzymes. And these have a slightly different effect in the body. And so a combination of Indian frankincense with turmeric and maybe another anti-inflammatory herb uh, would be a good combination to use. Uh, beyond that, boswellic acid has some anti-inflammatory and antimicrobial properties. Uh, there's concern with giving this and uh, a lot of the other residents during pregnancy. So uh, for this, I will use it mostly just for an inflammatory bowel type of condition. You'll learn other people will teach you about Indian frankincense as well in more detail on it. Myrrh is a classic herb for infection. And it's one of my top four favorite herbs for infection. Uh, baby Jesus received myrrh, gold, and frankincense. Not the, not the Indian frankincense I just showed you, but a different type of frankincense uh, as gifts. So the fact that it was given to baby Jesus, you know, we all can appreciate that it was revered. It's seen as value. It's burned as an incense, but it's also consumed as an antimicrobial internally and topically. There's studies showing that it exerts anti-parasitic effects on things like um, amoebic dysentery, giardia, bacterial vaginosis, uh, and trichomonas, which is another type of uh, infection of the, of, uh, the vaginal area. Um, historically, the eclectic doctors would combine hydrastis, echinacea, myrrh, and another uh, herb called pulp fruit, and would use it for um, tonsillitis and ulcers and infections in the uh, esophagus and throat. Um, I use this in combination with wormwood, golden seal, and podarco. And it's just one of my broad spectrum antimicrobials. Okay. Also, may exert some analgesic properties. So, for people with intestinal, uh, with like inflammatory or inflammatory bowel disease and um, uh, IBF, like symptoms, it can decrease the pain. So, lots of great things. It does not dissolve in water. You gotta use a really high alcohol percentage to get it to go into solution, okay? And the main active ingredients are what are called phrenocesquiterpenoids, kind of a unique little compounds that it has in there, okay? Podarco is a cousin, uh, phytochemically, it contains uh, naphthoquinones, and the other herb we talked about uh, earlier was black walnut. So in my opinion, black walnut which grows locally around here, is essentially almost the same, at least in my brain, it's the same as Podarco, except that Podarco grows in the tropics. They're both indicated for as an antimicrobial, they're used for uh, different types of infections, including parasites, bacterial, funguses. Uh, Podarco is used uh, for as an anti-cancer treatment as well. Um, so the main active ingredient is Zolapajol, which I suspect it works by disrupting the mitochondrial uh, electron transport ch ch chain um, because uh, structurally it's very similar to CoQ10 and it may be that that's how it works as an antimicrobial. That's just how I'm speculating. Um, beyond that, it has a mild laxative effect and a little bit of a mild astringent effect. So it's sometimes used for both constipation and infectious diarrhea, okay? So there's your black walnut. It contains juglone, a little bit different than the lapachol, but structurally, I think they both kind of work in a similar fashion, okay? For slides, stimulating laxatives. The archetypal stimulating laxative is Senna. Senna contains anthroquinone glycosides that when you consume them, you expect to have a bowel movement usually around eight hours. So you take it before bed, and it'll basically increase the influx of water into the bowels, stimulate peristalsis, and you usually have a bowel movement eight hours later, okay? Now, it can be associated with some cramping pain, so it's good to combine it with carminatives if people are getting some cramping pains with it. 
Obviously, you don't want to give it to people who already have inflammatory bowel disease where there's inflammation going on and there's and too much diarrhea. You also want to be careful about giving it to people uh, long term because after about seven to 10 days, people can become dependent on this. Okay. In addition to Senna, which is the classic one, it tends to be more of a Mediterranean, grows in Europe and slightly warmer climates. Now, in North America and probably in Northern Europe, buckthorn was more accessible and it too contains anthraquinone glycosides that acts as a stimulating laxative. I don't use this ever. I see it when I go on my walks in the, in the bush. There's a few different types of varieties that grow around here. They are indicated. You know, if we, if I was in a situation where I didn't have, couldn't go to the um, uh, pharmacy and pick up a stimulating laxative, then you could go out in the bush and gather the uh, the bark from this and make a tea from it, but I just don't use it very much. But I'm letting you know that these all work the same way that Senna does, contain slightly different anthraquinone glycosides, but they all work the same or could be used interchangeably. Aloe vera or aloe resin, not the gel. So the gel can act as a bit of a laxative, but not as a stimulating laxative, more of a bulk laxative because of the fiber content. Aloe vera resin, once you've taken the leaf and squeezed off all the gel, what's remaining if you dry it and then you scrape it off, there's a yellow resin there. And that yellow resin also contains anthraquinone glycosides. Certain, there is a formula called, I think it's formula 42 or 24, was used as a bit of a detox, uh, anti-parasitic substance where basically they had aloe resin combined with wormwood in capsule form, and you take it to basically purge out things out of the gut. And uh, so aloe resin could be used interchangeably with any of the other anthraquinone glycosides. I don't use it a lot, or if ever, but I usually use magnesium citrate for constipation, but I'm just letting you know that this exists, okay? Also, I suspect the anthraquinone glycosides exert some antimicrobial properties as well. So if you needed to purge up some parasites or bugs, that's one way to do it. And they all work by similar mechanism of increase, increasing the influx of sodium ions. More sodium means more water, and they also irritate the bowels, getting things to move along. Now, what's interesting about the anthraquinone glycosides is when you take them in orally, they don't exert an effect on the small intestine, and that's because they're glycosides. And it's once that glycoside enters, enters the large intestine, the gut bacteria there will hydrolyze that sugar molecule and remove it, liberating or activating the anthraquinone glycoside so it exerts effect. That's why it takes about eight hours for it to kick in, okay? Now, if you go and get a colonoscopy performer, you've been taking a lot of these stimulating laxatives, they will see what's called mel melanosis, which is basically spotting or staining of the intestinal wall, and then the doctor will know that you've been using it. Um, the other issue is because you're affecting sodium in the gut, that could disrupt potassium levels in the blood. And so people who are on certain uh, heart or blood pressure medications, you'd want to use with caution, okay? Last slide, castor oil. So castor oil is a very strong purgative. It's a stimulating laxative it's different than the anthraquinone glycosides. Basically, ricinoleic acid is the active ingredient. If you look at the structure of it, it's identical to oleic acid that's in olive oil with the exception of that one OH group at the, at the uh, near the end of the, the side chain of the fatty acid. That one OH group means it's no longer useful as a food, and that's what makes it so irritating to the bowels. When you take castor oil internally, not only does it cause your large intestine to basically increase the peristalsis and causes evacuation of it, but it will start working as soon as it hits small intestine because unlike the anthraquinone glycosides that require the bacteria to chew off the sugar to activate it, castor oil will start acting as soon as it hits small intestine. So it'll purge both small and large intestine and it does so in probably four to six hours. It works much, much faster than the anthraquinone glycosides. So I don't tend to use castor oil. Uh, you can just as an aside, it's been used historically to, uh, if a woman is, if uh, when she's pregnant, if she's um, uh, not going into labor fast enough and 
assuming that uh, the cervix is already ripened, then giving castor oil to speed up the process uh, can be used. We use that on my wife for a first pregnancy and it works, I think. Research shows mixed results, but I think if the cervix isn't dilated and you get castor oil, it's not gonna do anything. It's only really useful if the cervix is already dilated and you're trying to get things moving there. Uh, so internally, <coughs> it's a laxative. Comparably, excuse me, <coughs> you can apply it over the liver or on lymphatic tissue to get the lymphatic smooth, okay? So castor oil seeds are deadly poisons because they contain recin, which is a protein that's not fat soluble. So if you ate the seed, it would be very bad for you to do that, okay? But castor oil is very, very safe. Long-term use of castor oil internally will cause leaky gut syndrome. So I don't tend to want to use it very often. I might use it for a poisoning or if I just want to purge everything out of the intestinal tract or if I'm giving antimicrobials and treating SIBO or something and I want to try to flush out the small intestine, you can use that. But long-term use, I don't really like using castor oil. I've never taken the interline, but I have applied it topically for uh, castor oil packs and uh, arthritic pain and other things. Okay. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, it targets certain prostaglandins, EP3, that uh, does stimulate, stimulate uterine contraction. So it would be contraindicated to give the women that are pregnant unless you're trying to get the uterus to contract. And because it's not activated the large intestine and works in the small intestine, it'll start working in about three to five hours. So it's a much faster acting one. Not the most pleasant thing, but it is, it's pretty fast acting. So let's see how much over. Ooh, five minutes over, 12. That's a little longer than I meant to. Sorry about that. A reminder, next week we will see you in um, in the classroom. Please attend that. It will not be recorded. Um, I'll bring, I'll make it worth your while. I'll bring some little samples in you guys can taste. Uh, so come to class. It's a fun lecture. Next week's my favorite lecture because I talk about all the cool cases I've seen in practice, okay? Um, Allison had some questions. She seems to be good with that. Uh, if you have any other questions, let me know. The exam marks, I think, are released on Friday, so there'll be a few more days you guys can stress over how you did on that. Um, but, you know, as a reminder, worst case, worst case scenario, if you're in this lower group, study hard for the midterm or for the final, you'll probably pass. And if you don't, you can always write supplemental, you'll be okay. Any questions, email me. Otherwise, we'll see you next week. Okay, bye for now.